This story begins long before the birth of the main character of our narrative. After all, the boy Tutankhamun lived in a very tumultuous time. His childhood passed in an era of change, which even reflected on his own name. We're talking about events that took place over 3,000 years ago. In this video, first and foremost, we'll learn who Tutankhamun was. What was the life of the young pharaoh like? Why was only one undisturbed tomb of an Egyptian king found? How did the process of tomb excavation unfold? And what were the most interesting relics discovered in the tomb of the young king? Surely his name is familiar to everyone. You probably even envision that legendary mask of Tutankhamun in your mind. But despite this, there's much we don't know about him. As one historian said, Tutankhamun's greatest achievement was dying and being buried. Unfortunately, his life turned out to be short. But to understand this, we must go back to the 14th century BCE. In an era of Egypt's tremendous prosperity, power, dominion, and wealth, when pharaohs ruled vast lands upstream of the Nile and territories in Asia, when riches flowed like a river, the power of the pharaohs was immense. And Amenhotep IV, who ruled in the middle of the 14th century, wielded great authority. Just look at his depiction. These gigantic statues were many times larger than human height. This was because the pharaohs themselves saw themselves in this light. They genuinely believed in their divinity and their representation of the Egyptian pagan gods on earth. Even Amenhotep IV's name meant Amun is pleased. Speaking of gods, Amun was one of the most popular deities at that time. You must understand that the Egyptian pantheon encompassed over a hundred characters. Initially, Amun was just one among many. He had to undergo a whole evolution in the minds of the Egyptians. First and foremost, he was the patron deity of the city of Thebes. His significance grew alongside this city. Gradually, as Thebes, where the royal palace was located at that time, became wealthier, Amun's importance increased. The enormous temple complexes still bear witness to the incredible power of the priests of that time. Those who have been to Egypt probably remember those magnificent, colossal structures in Karnak and Luxor. It was here that ancient Egyptian Thebes once stood. And it was here that the religious cult of Amun was formed, developed, and overshadowed others. Naturally, this happened thanks to the diligent servants of this deity. His priests made a very cunning move. They claimed that, actually, this is one of the incarnations of the great god Ra. And Ra, of course, it was known throughout Egypt, because he was the sun god, the most important cult for the life cycle of the Nile River Basin. And the newly named god Amun-Ra became one of the most powerful and revered throughout all of Egypt. Now let's return to Pharaoh Amenhotep IV. He was displeased with the elevation of Amun-Ra, and in general, he didn't like the authority of the gods and the cult, which he poorly controlled, especially the immense wealth of the temples and priests. At least, that's one version according to historians as to why he carried out his religious reform. But there's a completely different version that suggests he was a visionary, a dreamer, a religious seer, and thus began the reforms. Thus. Amenhotep IV declared the solid true god, the sun disk god Aten. He changed his name Amenhotep, which means Amun is pleased, to Akhenaten, meaning beneficial to Aten, and initiated an incredible revolution. All temples were closed. Naturally, wealth flowed to the pharaoh, and not to the priests of Amun as before. And images of this god Aten began appearing everywhere, such as this symbol of the sun disk. The sun emits rays of light, ending with palms. It's believed that, with these hands, the deity touches all living things. Akhenaten left the old cities, where too much reminded of the old gods. He began building a new capital in the desert, Akhetaten, the horizon of Aten. Naturally, all courtiers followed him here, followed by traders, servants, and the capital flourished. But, as often happens, when Pharaoh Akhenaten died, his reforms were forgotten. The city of Akhetaten was abandoned, buried in sand. Archaeologists found it only in the 20th century. 
and its successors, of course, the priests quickly forced to renounce this new faith and return to the old one. And it's during this turbulent time that Tutankhamun grows up, who was initially called Tutankaten, meaning living image of Aten, and then he had to change his name and become the living image of Amun. This demonstrates to us how the situation in Egypt changed. We don't quite understand what happened after Akhenaten's death. Obviously, after him, some other young boy ruled, like Tutankhamun. Probably his name was Smenkkare. Judging by the root Ra in his name, the rejection of Akhenaten's religion had already occurred. And about Smenkkare, we know much less than about Tutankhamun. And as you understand, this is because there were no such amazing archaeological finds associated with the boy. But it's clear that he was a relative of Akhenaten's. In Egypt, to become a pharaoh, one had to be the husband of the pharaoh's daughter. And Smenkkare is quite often called the son-in-law of Akhenaten. Which, by the way, doesn't exclude the possibility that he may have been married to his own sister. For example, a half-sister, a blood relative from some other wife. Akhenaten himself, judging by the images, was a very sickly person. It seems that his descendants were not very healthy either. So Smenkkeri's short reign passes. The boy pharaoh quickly dies and he is succeeded by Tutankhamun. Again, it's not entirely clear whether he was the son of Akhenaten. Some believe he was the son of Smenkkeri, but he was definitely some relative. That's clear to us, he was married to the daughter of Akhenaten, who was initially called Ankesenpaten, meaning she lives for Aten. Well, then she successfully turned into Ankesenamun. Those who have seen the treasures found in Tutankhamun's tomb surely remember this stunning golden throne, on the back of which is depicted a young couple, Tutankhamun with his wife, both such fragile children, and the wife with such gentle movements, either strokes him or anoints him with oils and incense. In other items, you can see the girl offering Tutankhamun a flower to smell. Well, at least in these depictions, they look like such a beautiful, happy young couple. Of course, how it really was, we will never know. In any case, Tutankhamun ruled for a very short time. We don't know how much power he could hold in his hands being a young boy. It's possible that other regents stood behind him because of his youth. For example, the priest Ai, who later himself became pharaoh. Anyway, Tutankhamun dies young. The causes of Tutankhamun's death remain a subject of debate among historians, with several theories proposed. Tutankhamun might have been murdered by order of the regent Ai, who became the new pharaoh after him. Studies conducted in 2005 suggested that Tutankhamun died as a result of an injury. However, on March 8, 2005, the Egyptologist Zahi Hawass announced the results of Tutankhamun's computerized tomography, which did not reveal any signs of cranial trauma. The hole in the skull apparently appeared as a result of mummification. Previous X-ray examinations attributing severe scoliosis to him were also refuted. Research in 2010 indicates that Tutankhamun died from a severe form of malaria, with pathogens detected in his body during DNA analysis. This conclusion is supported by the presence of medicinal remedies for malaria found in Tutankhamun's tomb. Additionally, there is a possibility that the injury resulted from a fall from a chariot during hunting, as Tutankhamun's death coincides with the peak of the hunting season in Egypt. By the way, numerous studies have confirmed that the pharaoh died at the age of 17 to 19. It is more likely that he was 19 years old at the time of his death. However, regardless of the exact cause of the young pharaoh's death, it can be said that he was not particularly healthy. Egypt's Minister of Culture, Farouk Hosni, announced the results of DNA studies conducted from 2007 to 2009, which showed that Tutankhamun's family members suffered from genetic disorders. The king was found to have suffered from Kohler's disease, bone necrosis of the feet caused by impaired blood supply, cleft palate, congenital non-fusion of the hard palate and upper jaw, and clubfoot. These diseases were most likely the result of prolonged inbreeding among his ancestors. So Tutankhamun is finally buried. 
At this time, no pyramids were being built. Such colossal structures were erected in the 3rd millennium BCE. Why, you may ask? Firstly, it's obvious that building any pyramid required immense efforts. And secondly, there were looting activities. When the pharaoh built a pyramid, he was essentially showing everyone where vast amounts of wealth were buried. Not surprisingly, all pyramids, like all other tombs of the pharaohs, were looted in ancient times. Pyramids were always covered with inscriptions promising incredible curses. They were supposed to fall upon the heads of those who desecrated the tomb. But as you understand, none of these scare tactics helped. And perhaps one can understand the impoverished ancient robbers. Even in Tutankhamun's small tomb, such amazing treasures were found as a golden mask, gilded throne and sarcophagus, jewelry, and much more. We can only imagine what treasures were hidden in the Pyramid of Khufu. Even the tiniest finds, such as bronze handles in the pyramid's ventilation, seem incredible to us now. Archaeologists have long established that the Pyramid of Khufu is empty. It was looted in ancient times. But the beautiful and frightening burial chamber, the room where, obviously, Khufu's mummy lay, surely contained incredible wealth meant to accompany the pharaoh into the afterlife. Despite the empty tomb and pyramid, dozens of enthusiasts continue to tap the walls, shining special x-ray machines on them. Many researchers hope that this is a false burial chamber, and somewhere in the depths lies the real one containing amazing treasures. Unfortunately, so far, no one has found anything. Anyway, the pharaohs quickly realized that something wasn't quite right with the pyramids. And for ancient Egyptians, preserving the body after death was incredibly important. It wasn't just about burying a person according to all the rules. That's understandable because this idea is shared by other cultures around the world. For Egyptians, it was important to preserve the body, to preserve the mummy. The Greek historian Herodotus gave us a detailed, perhaps not very appetizing, but interestingly organized description of the mummification process. When it was a nobleman, when it was a pharaoh, their body was soaked in a special alkaline solution for 40 days. Then priests used special hooks to remove the internal organs, which is very correct from a medical point of view because it prevents the body from decaying. The internal organs were placed in special beautiful vessels, canopic jars, in the Museum of Fine Arts in the Egyptian Hall, you can see these beautiful canopic jars. They were also buried separately. And the mummy was further wrapped in bandages. Images of magical beetles, sacred scarab beetles, were placed on them. The priest conducted a ceremony, after which it was believed that the soul inhabited the mummy. By the way, in 1994, an experiment on the mummification of a modern person was conducted. An elderly person, after death, bequeathed his body to science. Most likely, he could not have imagined that he would go down in history in this way. The process of mummification was carried out by Egyptologist Bob Breyer. After receiving the body, Breyer went to Egypt and obtained 270 kilos of natron, crystalline soda, used as a desiccant. The scientist bought aromatic oils, frankincense and mire at the local market, and also made obsidian blades and bronze tools necessary for the task. Returning to the University of Maryland, the two researchers recreated the conditions of an ancient Egyptian embalming chamber in their laboratory, even washing the walls with palm wine. But let's tell the main thing. The process of removing the brain posed special difficulties. According to ancient texts, the Egyptians removed the brain of the deceased through the nose in pieces. However, the brain tissue did not want to be extracted in this way. Ingenuity was required by inserting a weir hook through the nasal passage into the cranial cavity. Scientists rotated it, whipping the brain like a whisk until it reached a fruit smoothie consistency. Then the resulting cocktail drained out through the nose on its own. Residues were wiped from the walls of the skull with linen tampons. And by the way, an x-ray showed that one of these tampons was subsequently forgotten in the mummy's head. Using an obsidian knife, 
Breyer made a four-inch incision in the abdominal cavity, through which the liver and other organs were removed. Small bags of natron were placed in the empty cavity, and then the whole body was filled with this drying powder, previously rubbed with myrrh and other remedies. After that, the body was left, as the ancient instructions dictated, for 35 days in a dry, hot room. The internal organs, sprinkled with natron, lay nearby on ceramic dishes. Upon returning, the scientists found that the method worked. Natron absorbed most of the body fluids, which showed no signs of decomposition. It lost about half of its weight and became stiff, shriveled, and blackened. That is, it already looked like a real Egyptian mummy. It was time to wrap the mummy in linen bandages. Needless to say, the fabric was also authentic, handmade. And again, the body was left in the laboratory for many days. At the end of the entire procedure, the mummy weighed just over 30 kilo. And when the scientists attempted to cross the deceased's hands over his chest, as is customary, they couldn't do it. The pose should have been taken care of earlier when the body had not yet lost all its flexibility. Nevertheless, the rest of the ritual was observed. Briar even recited the necessary incantations in ancient Egyptian. The mummy, named Mumab, mummy from the University of Maryland in Baltimore, is now kept in the museum. Over 25 years, it hasn't changed at all. Does this mean the procedure was reconstructed correctly? However, for reliability, it is worth waiting at least a thousand years. After this experiment, the researcher became known as Mr. Mummy. I wonder, did Osiris surprise to meet his follower after so many years? So, what's next? The Egyptians had a complex system where it was believed that a person had several souls. Some souls went to the afterlife, while others returned to their tomb. It was very important that here, firstly, the mummy was preserved, and secondly, there were images of the person. Hence, the walls of the tombs were adorned with reliefs showing the deceased enjoying life in the afterlife of Egypt. Or, for example, statues with the image of the deceased were placed directly in the tomb. This ensured the normal functioning of the soul after death. Tombs usually had something like a door, which modern scholars call a false door. It depicted the transition, but it couldn't be opened or passed through. The soul, of course, could pass through this door. Offerings were left before it, things the soul would feed on when returning to the tomb. So this is how all the rich and noble people were buried. Naturally, for ordinary people, everything was more modest, simple, and poorer. Tutankhamun himself, of course, was buried richly like other kings. A subterranean tomb was made for the little pharaoh. During the New Kingdom period, the nobility and royal family preferred their bodies to rest underground, in the valley known as the Valley of the Kings, where special guards provided protection. And so, for Tutankhamun, an underground tomb was dug, consisting of several chambers. His body was placed there in a sarcophagus. Several coffins were placed in the sarcophagus. Eventually, this huge sarcophagus occupied an entire room. This tomb was specifically designed to accommodate the body. Numerous amazing items were placed in the other rooms. Well, it's understandable that the pharaoh would need a lot in the afterlife. A chariot, a bed, clothes, musical instruments, and much, much more. We don't know for sure what happened next. Archaeologists and historians have established that Tutankhamun's tomb was indeed attempted to be robbed. Just like all the other tombs were successfully looted, there is not a single tomb in the Valley of the Kings that was not plundered. We don't know who these robbers were. Perhaps they were the same guards who were supposed to guard it, as often happens. Perhaps they were officials involved in burials. In any case, it seems that very soon after the burial, someone penetrated the tomb and tried to take out the treasures. Obviously, these thieves were caught. Howard Carter, the man who discovered Tutankhamun's tomb, makes remarkable observations in his book, The Tomb of Tutankhamun. Among the many items found, there was a scarf, into which heavy, solid gold bracelets and large rings were wrapped. And Carter reasonably argues that such an item is an ideal target for a stealthy thief. It's not like some huge statue that's difficult to carry away. 
These large rings wrapped in a scarf, most likely done by the thief, could be hidden, taken out, and sold for a high price because of the amount of heavy gold. Carter reasonably assumes that if the thieves, for example, heard someone approaching and fled, they would have certainly taken the bundle of jewelry. It's just too tempting and convenient. The fact that these bracelets were left lying on the floor in the tomb is perhaps an indirect but persuasive argument in favor of the thieves being caught. We don't know absolutely anything about what happened next, but we can speculate. Judging by the mess in the tomb when archaeologists found it, it's obvious that those officials or guards who discovered the thieves wanted to cover up their involvement. Perhaps they had guilty consciences. They hastily threw everything back, closed the door, sealed it, blocked the staircase leading down with stones, and left the tomb. Tutankhamun, of course, was quickly forgotten. He had no heirs. Apparently, his wife bore daughters twice, who died immediately or were stillborn. Ankhesenamun tried to hold on to the throne, and she made such an unexpected move for an Egyptian queen. She wrote a letter to the king of the Hittites, a powerful state, and said, Send me your son, I will marry him, and he will rule Egypt. It was unheard of for a foreign prince to marry an Egyptian princess and rule Egypt. Although some people believe that priests and regents may have manipulated the daughter of Akhenaten and her fate. For example, they forced her to marry and write to the Hittite prince to avoid an unwanted marriage or vice versa at the insistence of the adults. However, Russian Egyptologist Yuri Perepelkin told this story completely differently. He accused Ankhesenamun of being willing to do anything to hold on to power, because this chance to marry a Hittite was truly extraordinary. In any case, the Hittite embassy never reached Egypt from the Hittite kingdom. What happened next, we don't quite understand. Obviously, for some time, a priest named A ruled. Ankhesenamun died. There was turmoil for a while in the new kingdom. The dynasty changed and everyone forgot about poor Tutankhamun. This boy, who ruled for only a few years, accomplished nothing, was needed by no one, except perhaps his wife. He was forgotten. Akhenaten was not forgotten, he was surrounded by hatred. The priests even exacted the most terrible revenge for an Egyptian. They desecrated his sarcophagus, ruining his afterlife. And Tutankhamun was forgotten. After a while, another tomb was made here, in the Valley of the Kings, not far from Tutankhamun's tomb, for another pharaoh. The entrance to the tomb of the boy pharaoh was buried in sand. Nobody did it intentionally. It's just a characteristic of the desert where things happen very quickly. At this spot, workers building another tomb set up their huts. The tomb was constructed and the workers left. Of course, the huts were demolished afterward. However, the foundations of these huts remained, covering Tutankhamun's tomb. Thus, it became lost. This is why it remained undiscovered and untouched by anyone until the 20th century except for those thieves who attempted to do so in ancient times. And then Howard Carter appears, a man born in London to an artist family who received a good artistic education and became an artist himself. Of course, he grew up in Kensington, an area with many museums. Naturally, he visited such exhibitions a lot. And most importantly, Carter visited the famous British Museum Moreover, his father did a lot of drawing for the British Museum, completing various assignments. The boy could come there and look at the stunning Egyptian collection of the most famous museum in the United Kingdom. Perhaps at that time, it wasn't as huge as it is today, but there were already numerous giant statues of pharaohs, amazing artifacts, the Rosetta Stone, which deciphered hieroglyphs, many mummies, sarcophagi, it's no wonder that Egyptian antiquities always made a strong impression on children of all times. They truly inspired young Howard Carter. Another important thing happened next. He was often sick in his childhood. The air in London was always considered unhealthy. They sent him to his grandmother in another small town. His father often stayed with him there. His father was an artist, as I already mentioned. 
but with a very interesting specialization. He drew animals. As is well known, the English love animals incredibly. As has long been observed, in England, the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals was established 50 years earlier than the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, and any self-respecting Englishman has some kind of pet. And of course, if today everyone posts photos of their pets, then in the 19th century, everyone wanted to have their portraits. And Carter's father had no shortage of orders. He continuously drew horses, dogs, cats belonging to some noble and wealthy people. Not far from the places where Carter often spent time with his grandmother lived a noble wealthy couple, the Amhursts, who were incredibly interested in Egyptian antiquities. They had a huge collection. They, in fact, spent all their wealth on this collection, and today it is fragmented among various English and American museums. The Amhursts kept a mummy and many Egyptian antiquities in their mansion. They had seven daughters, and in the hall, there were seven statues of Egyptian goddesses that were supposed to protect their daughters. And the artist father of Carter often painted pictures for the Amhursts. He, naturally, took the boy, already a teenager, with him. They treated him very well there. Here he also saw all these Egyptian antiquities, was inspired, listened to stories, and became more and more interested in archaeology. It's no wonder that when Carter grew up, studied to be an artist, and started looking for work, the Amherst family gave him their recommendations. Thus, an artist and an amateur archaeologist found himself in Egypt. It was the end of the 19th century, and Egypt was under British control. Many English people lived or vacationed here, many conducted excavations, and some came here to improve their health. It was believed that the dry climate was very beneficial, and Carter was needed by various archaeologists, primarily as an artist. Let's not forget that photography was just beginning to become widely used. Of course, this technology already existed, but it wasn't as mobile as an archaeologist needed it to be. The artist was needed to sketch all archaeological and important findings. Starting from 1891, he worked with many distinguished archaeologists, initially as an artist, then he even conducted excavations independently. Howard Carter learned a lot. This would greatly help him later when he made his main discovery. First and foremost, the artist learned such crucial things in the archaeologist's profession as the excavation algorithm and precision in the process. Although, of course, by modern standards, archaeology at that time was far from perfect. But in any case, Carter made a good career here. However, suddenly in 1905, it seemed that everything came to an end. At that moment, Carter was an employee of the Egyptian Antiquities Service, headed by the distinguished French archaeologist Maspero. Among the monuments for which he was responsible was the famous Steppe Pyramid of Djoser, which many tourists already wanted to visit. Those who have ever vacationed in Egypt know how unpleasantly, unfortunately, the majority of tourists behave when they visit this country, and it must be said that at that time it was pretty much the same. A group of drunk, insolent French tourists appeared. They started demanding to be allowed to see the pyramid immediately. They insulted Maspero's wife, who was nearby. They wanted to force their way to the pyramid. Naturally, the Arab employees didn't let them. A fight broke out, and the Arab employees beat these tourists. After that, they naturally filed a complaint and demanded that these scoundrels be fired immediately. And Carter unexpectedly stood up for the pyramid's security. According to the English opinion, Carter dared to defend those insolent locals who beat Europeans. As punishment, he was transferred to some remote, faraway place, on a tiny salary, in a completely dreary place. And it was clear that he would either languish here for a very long time, or he would have to leave Egypt altogether and look for some other job. And that's where another important person in this story appears in the archaeologist's life. Specifically, the English aristocrat Lord Carnarvon, who comes to Egypt. Like many other Englishmen, he came to improve his health. Lord Carnarvon was a great enthusiast of all novelties. So, already at the beginning of the 20th century, he traveled by car and got into a car accident. 
but fortunately, it wasn't very serious. However, he was told that to improve his health, he needed to go to a warm place, to that very beneficial climate, to Egypt. So, the Lord went to Egypt, where he didn't quite understand what to do. Naturally, he became interested in antiquities and decided to invest money in excavations. He turned to that very Gaston Maspero, for whose wife Carter stood up when the scandal with the tourists occurred, and asked him to recommend a good archaeologist with whom they could conduct excavations. And Maspero, of course, recommended Carter to him. Thus began their years-long collaboration. Lord Carnarvon provided the money, and Carter dug in the Valley of the Kings. Of course, the archaeologist found many interesting things. Interestingly, their relationship went beyond that of sponsor and beneficiary, and evolved into good human relations, almost friendship. They were both incredibly interested in Egyptian antiquities. Such was their fruitful cooperation. Fans of the series Downton Abbey might be interested to know, the huge building, which in the series is called Downton Abbey, owned by Grantham, is actually in real life, High Clear Castle. This building still belongs to the descendants of Lord Carnarvon. And when the series was filmed, the lordly scenes, which take place in the castle itself, were filmed directly in this building. And the scenes where the servants act were filmed in the studio. This is the kitchen, various utility rooms, as usual in noble English houses, i.e., they look like such semi-basement rooms. They couldn't be filmed at Highclear Castle because these semi-basements now house Lord Carnarvon's Egyptian collection, which Carter found for him. Of course, the main antiquities and the most crucial findings are kept in the famous Cairo Museum. But in our timeline, the main antiquities are yet to be found. So Carter dug a lot in the Valley of the Kings and dreamed of finding a tomb untouched by modern or ancient thieves. In particular, he knew that Tutankhamun's tomb had not yet been found. The list of pharaohs remained ancient to historians, but where it was located was unknown. By the way, he had been digging nearby the place where Tutankhamun was buried for several years. As you recall, there were remnants of ancient huts covering the tomb. They hindered the archaeologist from reaching the desired discovery. Thus, the years passed. And already in 1922, after long excavations, Lord Carnarvon began to lose interest in the topic, and Carter himself lost a little enthusiasm. Well, they found some things, but no great discoveries were made. And at this moment, when it was already clear that it was time to wrap everything up, maybe even start a new project, suddenly in the Valley of the Kings, they discovered a staircase leading somewhere underground, blocked by huge stones. How Carter conducted further excavations was, of course, a manifestation of his incredible discipline and responsibility as an outstanding scientist. One can imagine how his hands itched, how he wanted to quickly scatter these stones and rush down to see what was there. Whose tomb was it? And was it plundered? Firstly, at that moment, they had just started digging and the season was already coming to an end. They had to block the descent again. Carter already understood at that moment that he was on the verge of a great discovery. He installed a gate, posted guards, and left. He had to wait for several months then the season resumed, he started digging again, dismantled this staircase, descended. He saw a door leading somewhere, as he himself wrote. If we had dug a few centimeters to the right, we would have already seen the seal on which it was written that this is Tutankhamun's tomb. I would have been spared many sleepless nights. But since they did it, they hadn't known whose tomb it was yet. It needed to be cleared further. And again, Carter showed incredible patience as he wrote, I considered it wrong to open the tomb without Lord Carnarvon, who had helped me so much in my work. Carnarvon was in England at the time. A telegram was sent to him. He, of course, dropped everything, rushed here with his daughter. And finally, they cleared the door. Carter punches a hole in it. Such methods may seem crude now, and of course, modern archaeologists work more delicately but there were no such technologically advanced careful technologies back then. So, Carter puts his hand with a lamp into the tomb. At that time, there were no electric torches, so it was a lamp with a live flame. 
and air that had been there for 3,500 years bursts out of the hole, causing the flame to flicker. And the archaeologist, of course, does not immediately see what is inside. And then from the darkness, amazing things begin to emerge. Today we already know in detail the contents of the tomb. Statues, chariots, a bed with some amazing animal head, alabaster vessels. Lord Carnarvon, who stands behind and, of course, is dying of impatience, asks, what do you see? Carter says, I see many amazing things. Next, they open the door, enter, and realize that they have a grandiose, incredibly heavy task ahead of them. A huge number of things have been found. Naturally, the desire to immediately grab them and start examining them arose. Firstly, this cannot be done. A real archaeologist must accurately record what lies where, what was found where. If Carter hadn't done that, he wouldn't have recorded that the gold rings were wrapped in a scarf, and he wouldn't have been able to build his theory of how the thieves were caught. But he carefully sketched, photographed, and recorded each item. Also, don't forget that this is Egypt. It's hot here. The tomb is very stuffy, and it's underground. Sometimes the archaeologist had to lie on his back to do something. However, Carter continued to work persistently. Let's discuss some of the problems the team faced. First and foremost, the wild presence of tourists hindered the researchers. The fact is that all the world's newspapers immediately wrote about Carter's discoveries. Many people flocked here, eager to catch a glimpse of these findings. At one point, Carter got very angry with the journalists. They wrote something that he didn't like at all. Then, the archaeologist in the luxurious Luxor Hotel in Cairo posted such an announcement. He banned journalists from coming to the excavations because they lie about everything. Well, then he reconciled with them, of course. The Egyptian government allocated a nearby tomb for them, empty for their use as a laboratory. And what was found in Tutankhamun's tomb was carefully transported there on stretchers for further study. So, during the excavations, more than 5,000 items were discovered. Let's talk about the most interesting finds. The first thing archaeologists noticed when entering the antechamber were the guardians of the passage to the burial chamber. A pair of statues guarding the entrance were made of painted wood with individual gold adornments. In total, four chariots were found in the antechamber. Carter attributed two of them to ceremonial chariots as they were richly adorned with gold leaf, inlaid with semi-precious stones, and the bodies retained fillets with flat relief. The chariots suffered from thieves who tried to break off their gold elements. Additionally, the chariots were too large, so the tomb builders partially sawed them to facilitate entry. The bodies, yoke, rim, and hubs of the chariots were made of maple, the pole was made of willow, and the spokes were made of plum. None of these trees grew in ancient Egypt, which was further evidence of developed trade with neighboring countries. Among the first items discovered and examined in the antechamber were chairs and a throne, a total of 12 furniture items. The throne, a specimen of Egyptian applied art, is one of the items symbolizing the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt. The gold adornments of the throne were broken off by thieves, but the carved wooden backrest and ivory remained. Researchers also examined, with great interest, a gilded alabaster shrine with canopic jars on sledges, which remained intact. Canopic jars were vessels in which the deceased's organs were placed. It was topped with a frieze adorned with small uraei. The construction replicated in miniature the complex burial and mummification ritual practiced by the Egyptians. Each of the four vessels was associated with four spirits, Imsiti, protecting the liver, Hapi, the lungs, Duamutef, the stomach, and Kibesenuef, the intestines. The statue of Anubis also impressed many of Carter's contemporaries. Its famous photograph from the tomb circulated worldwide. Another interesting find is a dagger made of meteoric iron, which unlike other iron items, was not affected by rust. During the New Kingdom period in Egypt, blacksmithing had not yet developed, so it was long believed that the dagger was carved by the Egyptians from a solid piece of meteoric iron. However, 
recent research suggests that the dagger was imported from another country. And of course, the most important finds were located in the pharaoh's burial chamber. The very first coffin that Carter saw was reddish in color. It was made of cedar or oak, inlaid with blue faience and adorned with protective spells. Then there were three more coffins of different colors and decorations. Inside them, finally, was the stone sarcophagus. At the corners of the sarcophagus, images of the goddesses Isis, Nephthys, Selket, and Nith were carved in stone, with arms wings protecting the pharaoh resting within. The crack on the lid was yet another evidence of the haste in which the tomb was constructed. The appearance of the sarcophagus bore obvious signs of modification and changes to the texts. The pattern with the wings of guarding goddesses was added to conceal part of the previously engraved text. This was another indication that Tutankhamun may have occupied someone else's tomb. However, the modification only improved the appearance of the sarcophagus, adding artistic value. The quartzite sarcophagus contained three sequentially nested anthropomorphic coffins, echoing the contours of the pharaoh's body. The two outer coffins were made of wood with gilding. All three depicted the pharaoh in the guise of Osiris and repeated, with some variations, the motif of the pharaoh's mask. And if the first two coffins were only gilded or adorned with gold decorations, the last sarcophagus was made entirely of pure gold, weighing 110 kilograms. Here, archaeologists finally discovered the mummy of the ancient king and the famous golden mask, which still remains a symbol of Egyptology. The young pharaoh is depicted in the guise of Osiris, wearing the name's headdress. The 10.23 kilo mask is forged from two sheets of gold with inlays of blue glass and lapis lazuli, while the eyes are made of translucent quartz. In his crossed hands are a chain and a scepter, symbols of royal authority. The mask showed a resemblance of the pharaoh to portraits of Akhenaten and Queen Tai, which indirectly suggested their kinship. Meanwhile, crowds always gathered in the Valley of the Kings, Journalists and curious onlookers waited at the entrance to catch a glimpse of any treasures from the tomb. As Carter writes, once they had to move a piece of leather from some leather item to the laboratory. They placed it on stretchers and while carrying it, photographed the piece ten times. Just a tiny piece of leather from Tutankhamun's tomb. Yet it was not the biggest problem. The difficulty lay in the fact that many items started to decay. Not everything was made of gold. There was wood, there were fabrics, there was leather. Much of what had been preserved for over 3,000 years in this isolated, sealed tomb. Environment was simply falling apart due to exposure to air and temperature changes. Carter had to tackle a huge number of chemical and physical problems. Special solutions were developed, which were also slowly applied to fabrics, sandals, scarves, to preserve everything and transport it to the museum. Only after such treatment could they be handled and transported. Thus, all these excavations required incredible patience. Much time was spent cleaning the first chamber alone. Only after that did they realize there was an entrance further inside. And after that, they were able to move into other chambers, finally reaching the sarcophagus. Here was another problem. The sarcophagus was so huge that it was unclear how to extract it. Obviously, it was assembled inside the tomb. Now, it had to be carefully sawed into parts, removed, and then put back together. And after that, perhaps the most important, crucial discovery was made when they reached the sarcophagus, when they saw this stunning golden mask, saw the pharaoh's mummy. And one of the most remarkable things for me here among all this gold, lapis lazuli, alabaster, amid all this luxury on this beautiful, marvelous golden mask lay a little wreath of simple flowers. And we don't know who placed it. Of course, one wants to believe Carter, who suggests that these flowers were placed by the grieving widow, that very young Ankesenamun, who would later vainly try to find another husband. The flowers were also preserved. They were sprayed with a special solution, 
brought to the laboratory, and biologists studied these flowers, saying that in Egypt they bloom in late May to early June. Thus, they even determined the time of year when the pharaoh was buried. All these amazing finds were sent to the Egyptian Museum, where fortunately they remain. During the Arab Spring, during the revolution in all Arab countries, when there were riots in Cairo, the people of Egypt did not want a repeat of what happened in Baghdad after the fall of Saddam Hussein, when hundreds of people rushed to loot not only Hussein's palace, but also museums, and priceless items from ancient Babylon disappeared. Therefore, in Cairo, dozens of people stood, holding hands, surrounding the museum, not allowing looters to approach it. And all because this greatest, most amazing discovery immediately aroused great interest in Egypt, incredible interest in Tutankhamun, in Akhenaten. For this country, it was the most important treasure. At the same time, of course, there arose many strange stories about the terrible revenge of the mummy, which still exist to this day. But on one hand, they were associated with the fact that a year after the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb, Lord Carnarvon died in Cairo, who was still a relatively young man. Apparently he, well, it was said that he was bitten by a mosquito, there was inflammation on his cheek, and then, when he shaved, he further aggravated this inflammation, causing an infection. Others said he had pneumonia, and of course, a lot of talk arose about it being the mummy's revenge, the pharaoh's revenge for intruding into his tomb. Amazing tales began about how, at the moment Lord Carnarvon died, all the lights went out in Cairo. Lights often went out in Cairo in the 23rd year. So, this is hardly to be taken as a sign from the mummy. People also said that, at the exact same moment Lord Carnarvon died, his beloved dog also died. The problem is, Lord Carnarvon was in Egypt, and the dog was in England. Who exactly determined the moment remains on the conscience of those who said it. Then they made a list of various famous and not-so-famous people who visited Tutankhamun's tomb and died afterward. Several of Carter's staff died. Some even took their own lives. Some died from serious illnesses. Various tourists died. Some from fever. And some, for example, were killed by a jealous wife. This, too, was attributed to the mummy. There was also an Arab archaeologist who started his career as a boy, helping Carter. And he... I don't know how seriously or not, but he explained to journalists that when he was a boy, Carter sent him on some errand to his home. And Carter, naturally, lived in a house near the excavations. And when he approached this house, he heard some noise. And it turned out that a cobra had crawled into Carter's house and eaten the canary sitting there in a cage. Of course, it's sad for the bird, as is known. But from this, a terrible conclusion was drawn. The cobra is a magical creature, which means that the gods are sending terrible punishment to Carter. By the way, later they also saw a canary at Carter's. Maybe, of course, he got a new one. I don't know. But the question arises, why did the mummy exact revenge so selectively? Why did it kill some who visited the tomb and not others? And, of course, why did it not touch Howard Carter, who lived another 17 years after the discovery, traveling the world, giving lectures about Tutankhamun's tomb, and died in his bed in London in 1939? Perhaps it's not worth trying to delve into the psychology of the mummy, or the psychology of those who tell these stories. It's worth just understanding that, of course, all talk of the pharaoh's revenge is a fairy tale. Fascinating, yes, perhaps very scary, but a fairy tale. Perhaps it speaks to something wrong about archaeologists opening tombs. Tutankhamun's mummy, by the way, was returned to the tomb, to his resting place, but without all the treasures. The main thing, of course, is not the tales of the mummy's revenge, but that the outstanding scientist made an incredibly significant discovery, not only finding this remarkable burial, but also analyzing, processing, preserving, and documenting it with the highest quality. And for this, of course, many years to come, science, tourists, and all those interested in the history of Egypt will be grateful to him. It will be interesting to read in your comments 
if there are any other archaeological or historical discoveries that, in your opinion, can compare in scale with the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb. Perhaps it makes sense to talk about these discoveries in our broadcasts as well. Thank you. Subscribe to our channel, watch other videos, and don't forget to like this video.